Uh, a very warm welcome to colleagues from across UCL, um, and a special warm welcome to those of you who've joined us from outside the institution. My name is Jennifer Hudson. I'm a professor of political behavior and the dean of the Faculty of Social and Historical Sciences. It is my pleasure to be here this evening to offer an introduction to Professor Mark Steers uh, for his inaugural lecture. The inaugural lectures at UCL are an opportunity to recognize and celebrate the scholarship and intellectual contribution of newly appointed professors. And tonight is really a celebration of Mark's career and achievements <coughs> to date, but I think also a look ahead at what we can expect from Mark and team at the Policy Lab um, and his intellectual agenda as he takes it forward. Mark is a recent uh, colleague at UCL, having joined us from the University of Sydney, and he is the inaugural director of the UCL Policy Lab. The lab is a joint initiative between the departments of economics and political science, and its motivation was to break down the barriers that keep the research that we do in this institution far apart from government, communities, policymakers, and campaigners. And I think Mark is exceptionally well-placed given his research agenda and his leadership uh, to do that for us. A little bit on the agenda for tonight. So I'm going to give you a very brief introduction, uh, introduction to, to Mark and his biography. We are then going to have Mark's lecture, and we're very lucky to be joined by Lewis Goodall this evening, who's going to chair a Q&A uh, with Mark. And I would then like to invite you to the South Cloisters for a drink uh, and for the conversation with Mark. Very briefly, before handing over, let me just give you uh, a bit of insight into Mark's research agenda and his work. So a very clear intellectual theme carrying through Mark's contribution in political theory and in his work here at the UCL Policy <coughs> Lab is the question of how, when, and why political reform comes about. His first book, Progressive Plur Pluralist and Problems of the State, Ideologies of Reform in the U.S. and in Britain from 1909 to 1926, Mark explored the connections between intellectual movements and the realization of reform. And in doing so, he brings together reform traditions in different countries, primarily understood in their engagement with national politics, but which he argued had deep international intellectual connections. Now, understanding the importance of connections between the national and international remained vital a century on from the period Mark first examined. In the last half decade, since the Brexit referendum here in the UK and Trump's election in the US, there has been both renewed attention to the common themes in US and UK politics and governance, although there have been many to have noted that these institutional, important institutional differences we shouldn't overstretch our analogies. But Mark's first book reminds us that it's not just a phenomenon of recent years, that ideas and understandings and common concerns have been shared across the Atlantic by those who seek reform in these countries. Mark's next book, Demanding Democracy, American Radicals in Search of a New Politics, turned his focus increasingly from the intellectuals who contemplated reform to the roles and the strategies of activists who demand reform. And here his concern with meaningfully inclusive movement for social change carries through to his ideas in his recent work. And yet another theme in recent political discourse, both <laughs> in the US and the UK, is this notion of disconnect, that politics sometimes fails to engage with ordinary citizens, their concerns, their lives, and the communities that they live in. This has become a core component of political rhetoric. And Mark's most recent book, Out of the Ordinary, picks up an important historical <laughs> analog to these concerns, exploring how artists and writers engaged with some of these challenges in the world of the 1920s and 50s, a world that presented dislocations that make ours look today relatively more manageable, maybe. Indeed, as you look through Mark's work, you can see a consistent commitment to understanding how political reform has engaged with citizens, with intellectuals, with campaigners, and those who connect them. And it's that intellectual project that makes Mark an exceptionally good fit for the Policy Lab and its inaugural director. The Policy Lab is meant to build connections, 
from political science and economics and across UCL to policymakers, campaigners, and those who can affect positive change in the world. And so it's with that, it's my enormous pleasure to welcome Mark to the stage, Professor Mark Steers. Thank you so much uh, to Jennifer for those uh, very kind words. Uh, and thanks so much uh, for all of you uh, for coming along tonight. I mean, it's so good to see so many friends, old and new, from all of the different aspects of my life, from the times I spent in academia, uh, in think tanks, in political campaigning, and in political parties. Uh, and there are all kinds of interesting conversations to be had here uh, over the drinks uh, after me and Lewis have finished uh, our chatting. Um, I was also going to say that the only people who aren't here tonight are fans of Australia or France. Uh, so then I noticed my wife is over there in the third row, and nobody cares more for the soccer rules than she does. So afterwards, we're going to say Aussie, 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 uh, and support the Australians as they do battle uh, on the football fields tonight. Anyway, a few weeks ago, I was in a hall very different to this one. I'd gone with the provost, uh, Michael Spence, and brilliant colleagues, Kirsty Walker, Steve O'Neill, Sam Greenwood, James Baggerly, to attend the British Political Party conference season uh, on behalf of UCL. I hadn't been to a party conference since 2014, when I had written the speech for the then Labour leader, Ed Miliband. Now, Ed's previous two speeches that I'd written had gone well, partly because, unlike me, he was able to deliver them without notes. Speaking with no notes, he said, gave him energy and connection, and he had a prodigious memory. And the 2014 speech started going really well, but then it went horribly wrong when he forgot a couple of very important chunks. The bit that dealt with immigration and the section on the deficit. Now, my friends and colleagues, some of whom are here tonight, huddled backstage hoping that nobody would notice. Uh, and surprising though it seems, it looked like we were going to get away with it. But then, an over-eager staffer released the official text without removing the bits that Ed had missed out. And word quickly spread amongst the journalists at the conference. And before the day was out, it had become clear that this moment of forgetting was going to be very memorable indeed. Ed was energized and connected, but for all of the wrong reasons. <laughs> so if truth be told, I've been a little bit nervous of leader speeches ever since. But this year, as a few of you can bear witness to, Keir Starmer's speech made me misty-eyed for another reason. Because there was one truly lovely moment in it when the Labour leader talked about his own childhood and hinted at a new direction for the politics of our moment. Starmer told us that he had grown up in a pebble-dashed semi in the 1970s, when his dad had a blue Ford Cortina parked outside. And he then went on to share how he experienced that decade of his childhood. I remember what rising prices felt like, he said. I remember when our phone was cut off because we couldn't pay the bill how hard it was to make ends meet. But, he continued, and here's the payoff. I remember the most important thing about being working class in the 1970s was hope. Not a grandiose, utopian dream kind of hope, but a hope that was ordinary, basic, taken for granted. Because like all families, although we had our ups and downs, my parents never doubted for one second that things would get better. Now, in all the various bits of conference wash-up, this was, I think, an overlooked passage in the speech. Perhaps there was just too much drama going on in British politics to notice this small phrase of calm. But I think it offers a really important insight into what might be possible in British politics right now. In fact, I would go as far to say it offers a potential fundamental frame for the next couple of years of political argument. Rising above the hurly-burly of day-to-day -day politics and the PMQs, or the policy anxieties of think tanks. A potential key theme for the coming general election that could give focus to all parties and to any new government. And that's what I want to explore with you tonight. 
In particular, I'm going to ask, is there something in this idea of ordinary hope that can provide the foundation for a bigger political argument? One that might help us all set our priorities, get through the pessimism of the present day, where the choice sometimes so often be, seems to be managing different ways of declining. Is it a new way of connecting, giving energy, and finding an optimistic possibility? In short, my question for this evening is, is ordinary hope an idea that can help us get our sense of our future back. Now, the search for an answer begins, of course, by making sense of what it was in that passage of Keir Starmer's speech that was so compelling, even for me, someone who's allergic to leaders' speeches. Now, it partly could have been that it tickled my academic interest. As Jennifer kindly mentioned, I've long written and researched about the ordinary. But most of all, I think the speech was powerful not because of its intellectual roots, but because of what it did at a human level. For me, it took me right back to my own personal experiences. When I was a little kid, probably six or seven, I also lived in a Pebble Dash semi on a street called Brookside in Dennis Powys, a commuter village just outside Cardiff. And the speech made me recall the favorite things I used to do in that world back then. One of them, was to go on a weekend shopping trip with my mum and my dad and my sister to the town of Cumbrac, which some of you will know is about 20 minutes drive away. Now, some of you have never heard of Cumbrac, but back then, at least to my eyes, it was the most amazing place in the world, the Blackpool of South Wales. <laughs> it was the town of the best biscuits. The Jammy Dodger and the Wagon Wheel were actually made in Cumbrac. And it had the best shops for miles around. It was also the town with the first fully integrated transport system in all of Wales. So you could arrive by bus and be dropped off right in the heart of the shopping. Or, as the adverts used to say, you could always get a spot in the biggest car park in Europe. <laughs> now, a little later, the brand would be celebrated in song by the irrepressible Welsh comedy hip-hop collective Goldie Looking Chain. Their song was called Fresh Prince of Cumbran. <laughs> now, I'm not going to try and rap it, but uh, I might after the drinks. But I'm going to read you a bit because it's important. Now, this is a story about a standard Welsh town with adequate facilities. So come on down. They've got a cinema, a biscuit factory, and it's built to plan. I want to tell you about a place that I know as Cumbran. Go on a day trip in the car. In the mornings, you can go to the reservoir. Then if you're bored in the afternoon, enjoy reasonably priced booze in the J.D. Weatherspoons. <laughs> now, as the song tells us, none of this was an accident. Cumbran was a new town. It was planned and designed by Clement Attlee's government in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War to offer new housing and new employment to the people of South Wales, whose prosperity for decades had depended on coal. It was designed to replace one source of ordinary optimism with another. And it wasn't only the transport system that was futuristic. It had a pedestrian precinct and a covered shopping mall before anywhere else in the country. It had the first McDonald's in Wales, and it had a homeware store where I, as a seven-year-old, remember enviously gazing at the colour remote-controlled TVs. But more than all of that, Cumbran wasn't just fun. It reverberated with the rhythm of the lives of the people who shopped. This was the tail end of what my undergraduate economics tutor, Andrew Glynn, called the golden age of British capitalism. As with millions of others at the time, my mum and dad were the first in their families to be able to go to higher education in the 1960s. And after college, they got secure professional middle-class jobs with salaries and pensions that their parents could never have dreamt of. And that allowed my mum and dad to buy a small semi-detached house in the suburbs where there were good comprehensive schools for me and my sister, and a new architect designed doctor surgery down the road, complete with abstract public art on the front, just to keep the neighborhood on its toes. Now, none of this had been available in the previous generation. So it was no surprise that my mum and dad thought the future was gonna get better too. Now, in some ways, of course, the future has got better. The shoppers in 1970s Cumbran would have been amazed by the advances in science or technology that some of you are holding in your hands right now. Stop it. 
giving yourself access to the greatest libraries of the world, as long as Edgy Rome is working. <laughs> now, they wouldn't have believed that the Berlin Wall or apartheid would have crumbled so fast. And I think, or I like to think, that they would feel proud of how rapidly social attitudes towards different ethnicity, sexuality, and gender have advanced in South Wales and across the country. But it's nonetheless very hard also to shake the sense that there remains a huge gulf between the expectations of those post-war generations and the outlook that confronts millions in Britain today, especially when it comes to the economy. We don't live in a golden age anymore. The British economy has been characterized by low growth and high inequality for decades now, leading to a series of intensifying challenges, persistent low pay, deeply precarious work, an inability to get on the housing ladder or to find an affordable and safe home to rent. Did you know that low-income households in the UK are poorer than their counterparts in France by a quarter? And these problems affect far more than just those at the bottom end of the income distribution. As a Policy Lab's honorary professor, Torsten Bell, has calculated, eight million young people in Britain have never worked in an economy that has sustained rising wages. One in four adults in the UK say they could not survive on their savings for more than a month. And the consequences of this exceptional economic insecurity are widely felt. As my wonderful UCL colleagues Imran Razul and Wendy Carlin say, these experiences eat away at people's ambition and they hold the whole country back as a result. Who's going to take a risk on the future, set up a business, invest in a new skill when they feel as vulnerable as that? And bad as it all is, it's been made even worse, I'm sorry, by a series of enormous additional shocks. The act of economic self-harm that was Brexit, the virus of populism that was Donald Trump, the actual virus that is COVID-19, Putin's horrific war in Ukraine, and all that before the climate crisis really takes hold. It's no wonder that some political economists, including former colleagues from my days at Cambridge, Adam Tooze and Helen Thompson, have argued that we live now in an age of poly or perma crisis, that we're living through a series of profoundly connected, deeply damaging events, that render the return of anything like the golden age of capitalism totally impossible. It leaves people, it's leaving me, in a state of despair. And that is what Keir Starmer intends when he says that he thinks that we have as a country lost our sense of the future. It's a very bad place for a country to find itself. Now, losing this sense of a positive future is a problem in itself. But more than that, it's understandably made people furious. And that's had an enormously disruptive impact on British life. At least since the financial crisis, rage has been the indisputable emotion at the heart of our politics. And those technological advances that would have blown the minds of our parents in the 70s give the angriest the loudest voice. I bet that almost everyone in this room has been driven by something in Britain recently to send an abusive quote tweet or to shout at someone in a Facebook or WhatsApp group or end up just screaming at the TV. It just doesn't stop. Every Thursday evening, my Twitter timeline is full of people insisting that no one should ever watch the TV show Question Time. Tweeted whilst they're sitting on their couches watching Question Time. <laughs> In the words of another Policy Lab honorary professor, the playwright James Graham, it sometimes feels like everyone in Britain is just desperately trying to reboot the computer, but they can't get it to work. They keep on pressing all the buttons, shouting, pressing the buttons again, but the thing just won't reboot. Nothing happens. The technology is not so empowering after all. They want to smash the screen. And then take Liz Truss. Now, as some of you know, Liz Truss was a student of mine. I won't claim that I taught her everything that she knows. Uh, but her short-lived prime ministership has proved something. Uh, over the summer, Liz Truss, I think, tapped into the rage among ordinary members of the Conservative Party. She got elected by them, about 80,000 of them, and then she felt empowered to bang a few buttons looking for that James Graham reboot of the system. 
For her, the button she banged were 45 billion pounds of tax cuts, mainly for the rich, funded by massively increased borrowing, defying the orthodoxy. That'll show them, you can almost hear a saying to Quasi Quarteng. You can, I think, understand why they thought everything needed to change. But the way that they went about it was with the kind of empty, grandiose, utopian dream that Keir Starmer warned against in his conference speech, and to which ordinary hope might prove an antidote. Part of my argument tonight for you all is that smashing the buttons doesn't work. But even now that trust has been shuffled out, in some quarters the rage continues, morphing into a series of ever more grand and ever more imaginary solutions that people say will magically fix all of our ills. Snake oil politics. We've seen masses of it in recent years. There are those who apparently think that if we stem the tide of immigration, we'll instantly return to the 1950s, when we still had bits of an empire and lived off spam and coal. There are advocates of global Britain, the Brexiteers, who think that they can instantly restore prosperity if we forget about Europe and head off to the high seas with a dash of daring do and a bit of the old Captain Jack Sparrow about them. And for Labour people, I'm afraid there was Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party, with as expansive a list of impossible policy promises as has ever appeared in the British election manifesto. Even here in academia, there have been endless versions of some magical reboot, moonshots or missions that will somehow make everything better. But as the trust experiment shows, in the real world, we don't get to boldly go just by wishing to make it so. That kind of exaggerated, puffed up, wishful thinking fails to address the real challenges. It is a problem and not a solution. And it also exacerbates the anger, feeding the aggressive, populist, paranoid style of politics that we've all become used to, dividing the world into true believers or enemies of the people, where the noise, ferocious emotion, willingness to set reality to one side, leaves most of us feeling utterly overwhelmed, exhausted, disoriented, dizzy with the chaos of it all. Real change does not emerge in an atmosphere like that. Real change needs a calmer head, a sense of stability, firm foundations from which we can make good judgments and plan real progress. As the American political strategist David Axelrod recently put it, it's just time to tap the brake. And all of that takes us back to ordinary hope. Because if grandiose dreams have no purchase, perhaps ordinary hope can fill the void. But then we would have to know what it means. And although that speech introduced the idea, I don't think even Keir Starmer would admit that he's filled it out with very much detail. What should be clear, though, is that if it's going to be actually hopeful, it can't just be a return to the status quo. Now, after the collapse of Liz Truss's premiership, Politicians of all persuasions have looked for the safe, the orthodox, the apparently predictable. L Lewis can tell us later, but you know, political commentary is full of it at the moment. You know, emphasis on keeping the market settled, if not happy. Respecting treasury orthodoxy again. Making fiscal and monetary policy work in lockstep. Getting debt falling. There's also been the talk of the need to stabilise other key institutions in the country. Prevent the NHS from toppling over this winter. Preserve the BBC as the world's greatest public service broadcaster. Make sure great universities like this one can continue to prosper even in difficult times. Now, there's evident sense in all of that. But there is also real danger that a preservationist impulse takes over, and that offers as little as the exaggerated grandiose one does. Because the institutions to which we traditionally turn for safe harbour haven't actually offered all that much to many of late. And you get reminders of that wherever you look. On the advice of my friend and colleague John Stokes, who's here this evening, I picked up a new novel recently, Natasha Brown's Assembly. It's deeply disturbing. So thanks, John. <laughs> Uh, in the novel, the lead character, a young black woman, travels through some of the major institutions of our country. She goes to Oxford. She gets a job in finance. She needs the health service. She has friends in politics. 
And she experiences the most horrific, callous lack of concern in each and every one of them. Now, if anyone who's read it will know, her boyfriend in the book is particularly horrible. And as we're told at the end, he is a political speechwriter. <laughs> of course he is. So, so she wonders aloud as the book comes to its close about whether he could write speeches about the awfulness of her experience just so she can share with the public what she's gone through. It's not possible, says horrible speechwriter boyfriend. There are conventions, he explains, familiar palatable forms which are designed to foster understanding. We have to sugarcoat the rhetoric. We have to make them uh, embedded within a story, make everything relatable. There's only so much honesty the world can take, is what he says. And it's clear to anyone who reads Assembly, even a speechwriter, that persisting with faith in convention is a route to disaster. The worst thing that British politicians can do in the aftermath of Liz Truss is simply offer the country yet more denial. As Helen Thompson puts it, until politicians get real about how dysfunctional the economy has become, they will keep being humiliated. But, I can hear you screaming, if neither rage or exaggeration, nor the false security of the status quo offer a way forward, what does ordinary hope actually mean? I think, as speechwriters have a tendency to do, that there are three parts of an answer. <laughs> It begins by placing the fundamentals of everyday life at the core of our politics. That is, it's about feeling no embarrassment on focusing on the things that matter to us all in our ordinary lives, rather than on anything grand and abstract. It's about prioritizing what the Americans call kitchen table issues. The prices of the everyday goods we rely on. Our experiences at work, from the wages we get to the relationships we have with our boss. Our kids' daily experiences at school, the chances we have of getting an appointment with the GP, the security we feel in family life, our pride in the sense of place from our communities or our neighbourhoods. These aren't small issues, as some politicians and academics sadly continue snidely to suggest. They are what matter to people in their day to day. Far more important to all of us than any of the grand aspirations or abstract goals that we've been constantly sold by our politics of late. Second, it's also about showing how taking action on those immediate issues also offers a promise for the future too. I'm not talking tonight about <laughs> retail offers or rabbits out of a hat, short-term interventions designed to make the pain go away or to get a quick headline. Instead, I think that each and every policy intervention should be designed to make today better, but also to create the conditions for a better tomorrow too. Ordinary hope is about using policy to address the drivers of the perma crisis at the same time as we address the here and now. Third, ordinary hope is also about showing that real action in all of these regards doesn't come from on high, but it depends on the power of ordinary people themselves. It means accepting that the future is not just going to be given back to us. It'll have to be made of you by people of all different backgrounds in all different places acting consciously together. As Lisa Nandy puts it, ordinary hope is about recognizing that those with skin in the game matter the most. Now, I'm aware, of course, that all of this is horribly abstract. So before I close this evening, let me share with you just one way in which I think this ordinary hope idea might work in practice. My friend and colleague Tom Baldwin are currently writing a book together about England. In it, we visit seven places across the country which capture the challenges people are facing. For one chapter, we went to Blackpool in Lancashire. And as anyone who watched Strictly this week knows, Blackpool was once the global centre of entertainment. It's even more exciting than Cumbran <laughs> was to a seven-year-old. It was the first place in the world to get electricity and they used it to create the spectacular illuminations that will go all down the seafront in, in an effort to cheer up visitors on autumn nights like this one. But now, Blackpool is also one of the poorest places in the country. Out of 33,000 council wards across all of England, eight out of the 10 poorest are in Blackpool. 
And the consequences of this are intense. More than a tenth of the town's working age inhabitants live on disability benefit. It has the highest rate of antidepressant anti prescriptions, more than two per person of anywhere in the country. And life expectancy for men is 25 years lower than it is in London's richest boroughs. If there's anywhere that needs hope right now, it is Blackpool. Now, there have been endless ideas to revive the town from the politicians, but they've all been of the big and grandiose type, the magical reboots. People have talked about super casinos. They've talked about something high-tech called Silicon Sands, which is said to enable doctors in New York to conduct brain surgery in Blackpool via artificial intelligence. I'm not making this up. There's a talk of a comedy cultural heritage center. Of course, there was Brexit, which the town voted for overwhelmingly. There's been talk of free ports, of leveling up, of investment zones. Anyone remember them? And what all of this means is that money has been spent on Blackpool, but money has been wasted. Hunting for some magic silver bullet far removed from the actual lives of people in the town. So what would ordinary hope actually look like for Blackpool? Well, it should start with what's most urgently needed for the people who actually live there. And that is care. Care for those who grow up and grow old there. Health care, including mental health care. Social care for the elderly. Support care for those who live with disability. Child care. That was what will have the biggest impact on the real lives of the real people of Blackpool. And it's not just about making the current situation a bit better, vital though that is. Investment in care would be a down payment for the next generation too. Because when we look at Blackpool through the lens of ordinary hope, we see that investment in care is investment in the future. There are so many more prospects for Blackpool if we can stop thinking about jobs in the caring sector as somehow second class, and begin instead to see them as skilled work, deeply valued by those who need it, and admittedly, all of us probably will. Effective care could be the foundation stone for a stronger, more effective economy for that part of the world. And it's not just me that says this. The Office of Budget Responsibility, of all people, said last week that the cost of health and disability benefits is set to rise by £7.5 billion this year, and that people falling out of employment because of chronic ill health is one of the largest drags on Britain's prosperity. A healthier, happier, more secure population would be a more productive and prosperous population too. We should be learning as a country to spend sparse resources on creating decent jobs and quality services in the places that need them, not chasing after some pie in the sky. And this plan for a humbler, more practical, ordinary hope doesn't stop there. For care to serve this purpose, its quality will have to transform too. We need to make services in Blackpool and in every other town in the country fit for people to receive in the 21st century. And that's not just about money and investment. It's about harnessing the new power of technology. And most of all, the evidence is now clear, it depends on releasing the energy, creativity, and insight of those who work on the front line. Stop trying to control everything from the center. As brilliant reformers like Hilary Cottam and Donna Hall have shown, real reform in caring services means giving real power and responsibility to those who know how to provide it. Nurses, teachers, workers in care for the elderly, and for those who receive care too. They should be able to use their expertise to inform and transform the services they depend on, as other countries in Europe are now showing. It's the power of people themselves that will remake care. It's care that will remake Blackpool. It's care that will restore our faith in the future. So let me come to a close. We've lived in really difficult times for the last few years. So difficult that five years ago, I flew thousands of miles away and moved to a beachside suburb in Sydney. <laughs> now, it's not as sunny in Bloomsbury, but I am delighted to be back, especially here at UCL. And that's in part because there's an emerging sense now of possibility, 
a glow on the horizon. It doesn't shine that bright, and it might not be easy to reach. But unlike the magic, flashy, extravagant missions of recent years, it's not a false dawn either. And as we move towards it, we can use that light to make our own path, concentrating on the immediate challenges in front of us, not disdaining them as too small to be worthy of our concern, taking one small deliberate step at a time in the right direction for the future, and realizing that we'll only get to that future when more people's energy is engaged, not less, fewer kids are left behind, the voices of those who are less privileged are no longer ignored. That's what I think the next two years of our politics should be about. Asking which of the parties, which of the leaders, do the most to provide that sense of ordinary hope, and doing our own part to help them on their way. Here at the UCL Policy Lab, we want to play our part in this process. That means opening the doors of this great university to anyone who wants to be part of the conversation. Lowering the barriers we find between people of different backgrounds, different opinions, different walks of life. Listening to their stories, their experiences, the ideas that will shape our future. Finding areas upon which we agree and on areas which we can't, learning to disagree well. And directing our research, our teaching, our social commitment, not just on the basis of some grand abstraction that sounds exciting in a faraway conference center, but on the aspirations of those who actually live around us. That's what ordinary hope looks like from here. It will have a different shape in your workplace, your community, or your institutions. But my argument tonight is that it will matter all the same. And I cannot wait to hear what you think you might be able to bring to get that better, fairer, more confident future back into our grasp. Thanks very much. Hi everyone, my name, in case you don't know me, my name is Lewis Gould. I uh, am analysis investigations editor for Global. I used to sit in lecture halls like this with this august professor at one point. So this is extremely, uh, I, was, I was saying to Mark just before that I'm very pleased that he's alive because I noticed on the signs downstairs, it said the Mark Steers inaugural lecture, which made it sound like he died. So I'm very really <laughs> pleased to say actually that colon was really important. Mark, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, I, just this co concept of, Ordinary hope. You're obviously tying it very close, and we'll come to questions. I'm just going to indulge my indulge, indulge myself for a couple of minutes. Um, you tie it to this idea of perma crisis. So I suppose in a way, my question is is twofold. Is one, do you, is there a, do you think there's a historic parallel for this age of perma crisis? I something that we can sort of draw it back to and say something similar has happened before. And if so, was the answer to that at that time? something akin to what you're saying. Because in a way, well, it's not, because you could argue it's the other way, right? That if we are in an age of perma crisis, what this actually needs is the big vision. It needs a, we're, without getting too Gramscian about it, we're at the end of a consensus and we need someone to make sense of it for us. And maybe the danger is this idea of quite incremental change, important as it is, doesn't really cut the mustard. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that's a, it's a crucial question. Thanks, thanks Lewis, and such a pleasure to be here chatting with you. Well. Uh, I mean, the, the crucial, Kind of theme which has animated a lot of the arguments I've been trying to make over the last five or six years, I think, is that it's a false dichotomy between the big and the small. Now, there are some people in politics who think you've got to do big, grand things because the challenges are big and grand. Liz Trust. Yeah, exactly. And if you can't do big and grand, you might as well go home. You know, go, go big or go home, um, some folks say. And that, that you know, that historically, to me, that's always looked like an error that actually when you look at the big and grand things which have happened in politics, they've almost never started from a big grand manifesto commitment uh, here in the UK or elsewhere in the world. They've instead started from much apparently smaller kind of interventions. So to give the most obvious, if slightly cliched example of that, some of you will have heard me say this before, but like the US civil rights movement is probably the biggest transformation of America 
in the 20th century. I mean, fighting for racial justice, putting an end or trying to put an end to the scar of slavery. And yet it didn't start with Lyndon Johnson's, you know, acts in, uh, you know, during, during the Great Society. It didn't even start from the big talks of Martin Luther King. It started by step-by-step -step desegregation campaigns and projects from the 1940s and 1950s. So as everyone knows, it was Rosa Parks who started that process off by not moving on the bus, not the signing of some grand declaration at the heart of Washington. And that, I think, just shows that this apparent disconnect between the big and the small is wrong. And in fact, without the apparently small, you never get to the actually big. Well, I'm going to put, I'll push you in a way on the idea of a parallel, because in a way, I mean, you know, in a way, surely, if we're going to look back in order to try and find some sort of proximate thing. So do you think there is a sort of equivalent period of the sort of age of perma crisis that we're in now? Look, the, the easier, the closest we can come, or the closest I've been able to come in my own work, again, as Jennifer kindly mentioned at the start, would be the interwar years, the depression, the rise of fascism. I mean, their parallels really are very stark. Um, and again... But, but, but just, I mean, yeah. you know, Someone like Clement Attlee at that time, he, yes. he was talking big. I mean, yeah. he, was talking, I mean, he, was, he was a not very laconic, modest man, but he was talking about New Jerusalem. But so 19, the, the 1945 is the end and not the beginning of that process. I and mean, one of my favourite books is Paul Addison's book, The Road to 1945, uh, which came out about two decades ago now. Um, shows there's no new arguments in politics. Um, but in the Addison book, he shows that step by step, the welfare state consensus was made by first of all voluntary action through cooperative societies and friendly societies and trade unions, then by local politics, especially here in London, a remarkable work that Clement Attlee himself did in local politics and other colleagues, building an argument until it became mainstream and accessible. So much so that of course it's William Beveridge, a liberal, who gives us the prototype for the welfare state in the Second World War. And that Beveridge commitment is made in fact by the coalition government that took us through the war. And then only in 1945, and at that particular moment, does it become associated with the Labour Party. There's no big bang. There's two decades of deliberate action on small, everyday local issues. But your uh, concrete example around care, which of course I think everyone in the room would agree is completely broken in Britain at the moment, and talking about Blackpool, which I think is still a global home of entertainment, <laughs> I should say, um, is, you know, I mean, you can argue that a lot of the things that you identified are a result of, you know, long-term British economic decline. And essentially all of the kind of various great visions that you identified, whether it's Corbynism or Brexit or Trussonomics or whatever it was, they were all attempted prescriptions for that diagnosis. It was the same diagnosis, they were just very different answers. And in a way, you know, to take your care example, we may have ordinary hope, but if you can't fund it, if you can't find a way of genuinely regenerating the British economic model, then there's no, you don't get the hope, right? Because you don't get those things. And I'm just wondering, like, what does ordinary hope as a concept have anything to say to that? Or is it just a sort of about the answers rather than the inputs? Yeah, no, no, I mean, again, that's a crucial question. I mean, there are more economists in the audience who have better answers than me to that one. Uh, but the, the essence of the answer, I think, is that there starts with the, with the basic fact that there is no magical solution to the crisis in which British capitalism finds itself. And the hunt for one, although emotionally and psychologically understandable, is a distraction from the real work that needs to be, get, we need to be getting on with. So you know, beginning the process of finding better quality work for more people is, in my view, the first, maybe incremental, but it's nonetheless fundamental step towards being able to right the ship of this economy in which we find ourselves. So is ordinary hope a technocratic argument? No, because the dimension of it that matters most of all is that process has to involve collective and, and popular engagement so that you can't retrain a care workforce from Westminster or Whitehall. You can only do that, and any of the medics in the room will be able to tell us that too. Um, any, you can only do that process uh, if you actually bring workforces and communities with you along the way. I mean, uh, many, again, many of you have heard me say this a million times, so apologies, but you know, since I got back to London, the proudest and most exciting thing for me is my seven-year-old daughter's primary school uh, in Hackney, Bentville Primary School, a uh, multicultural school in a very uh, deprived neighbourhood that provides the most extraordinary commitment from its teachers as a result of the dedication and the insights of its head teacher working in partnership with the local council. And although, you know, when I say that, people think, oh, it's, it's a kind of small thing, you know, what does a seven-year-old's math class matter? But 
In Britain, where we have so little hope at the moment, a seven-year-old's maths class means an enormous amount. And you can't get that without high-quality teaching, feeling empowered in the classroom, working alongside those people who regulate and control and fund it. So finally, just before I open up to everyone, just to link it back to your personal political experience. I'm struck by, remember in the immediate aftermath of 2015 election defeat, and Ed Miliband, you know, your old boss and friend, talking about that defeat and about his period as, as leader of the opposition. You know, he had said that he felt that he, far from being a, la- a lack of incrementalism or a lack of realism, he felt that he hadn't been sufficiently radical. And he felt that the, the sort of crucial moments, inflection points around Corbyn and Brexit so had proved that right. I mean, how do you think that, well, I don't know whether you know if he's changed his mind about that, but I mean, so is that a point of disagreement, do you think, between the two of you or... Or is it slightly more complicated? Ah, that's a great question. Uh, I'm smiling because there are some people in the room who will know those arguments. So, you know, back in, back in the day, 2014, 2015, I would write a draft speech for Ed and I would take it in and it would be full of what I hoped were, you know, funny jokes or emotive anecdotes or bits of real life. Uh, and he'd look at me and say, it needs to be bigger. Uh, <laughs> and I'd say, oh, OK, and I'd kind of go away. Uh, and then, you know, you kind of make, make it a bit bigger and you talk to the various other folks there and you come back. And then you take one look at it and say, we're not that big, obviously. <laughs> uh, so, you know, so like, look, politicians, I think, like Ed, are confronted with really impossible choices that they need a compelling story to tell to the world, which is going to attract people to their tent. Uh, but they also need radical plans for change. I think in the commentary that you described, Ed's reflections were perhaps he needed to be bolder and more confident and bigger in, and order, bigger in, in, in order to find that public support. Uh, in 2015. Personally, I don't think that's what did it, but you know that's obviously his right to have that distinction. But I don't think that anyone really believes that that bigger vision is what you would have needed to turn the country around. You know, If the Labour Party had won the election in 2015, we would have avoided some mad utopian experiments like Brexit, but we wouldn't Chaos have... With Ed Miliband, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What we would have got on with, I think, is very practical very concrete, very real, very ordinary programs for change. And in my view, and hopefully in some other people's views here tonight, that would have made the place better. Let's take some uh, questions. Perhaps if you, would you like to set them in three rather than individually? Yeah. Or... Let's do that, shall we? Mm-hmm. Lady at the back there. Um, my question is really about, um, I love the concept of ordinary hope, um, but it feels perhaps at odds with the moment we are at in terms of the climate change agenda. And I just wonder how you've begun to reconcile the importance of ordinary hope when the climate issues are not necessarily as impactful at the everyday level for the ordinary family and and some of the radicalism that may be required to to kind of make a difference in the next two years, as you've been saying, is the kind of time. I mean, I suppose that, that sort of relates in a way to some of the points that I've been trying to get at, which is yeah. that whether ordinary hope quite rises to the challenge of the sort of permacrisis age that we're in. Yeah. I'm just going to I'm just going to give that to you straight away. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, the twofold answer that I mean, the first part of the answer is like totally understands the urgency, the impatience, the need for bigness in response to climate. I mean, I, the evidence base is, I think, unquestionable in that regard. And especially from the perspective of younger generation, it, it is absolutely crucial to our future. The, the, the second part of the answer, though, is that in order to get that change, you need to be able to move in meaningful ways. And moving in meaningful ways means bringing people with you uh, and getting projects up and running now rather than waiting for the crisis to hit to transform public opinion. And to give you a really concrete example of that, in my Sydney days at the Sydney Policy Lab, one of my proudest projects uh, was with a colleague called Amanda Tattersall, and it was called The Real Deal, which was a, a riff off the Green New Deal. Um, people didn't know what a New Deal was in Australia, so you couldn't call it that. So, so it was called Real Deal. But what Real Deal did was place by place deep work with coal mining communities and other hydrocarbon communities to try to develop an economic program for the transformation of those towns. Uh, and it's been incredible to see the impact of that. And it's actually not that slow. 
Once you tell people that you have them in mind, that you're looking for a future that works for them, you're willing to listen to their concerns and you build a program, actually much of the political anxiety about the climate transition drops away. Um, and although I was something of a critic of Anthony Albanese in the run-up to the last um, election in Australia, I actually think that in some ways Albanese's leadership has personified that. Gentle, engaged, every day, unthreatening, but actually making important, vital transformations which get us to grips with the climate uh, catastrophe that we face. The gentleman there, the orange jumper. <clears throat> thanks, and uh, thanks for that, um, My question's about uh, the relationship between the capacity for ordinary hope and the media ecosystem and how that might have changed since the last examples that you were talking through earlier. So on the one hand, um, the way you were describing the, the work with Ed Miliband um, is in some ways a distinction of campaigning and governing, and you might have needed that for campaigning, different for governing. And it feels like we've been stuck in a campaigning mode in the last, the last six years. At the same time, local newspapers, local radio is all, has all withered away in, to a large degree. And so the ability to know about local issues and the kind of ordinary everyday projects and hope that exist in different places might have diminished too. Um, so I just wonder if you have any reflections on the question. I think I've got more while we're, while we're here. Uh, the gentleman here and then the lady next to Hi, Mark. Um, this push to um, devolving decisions to local communities, I want to ask you a bit more about what happens when communities give answers that you don't like. Um, you know, look in the US, if you asked a community in West Virginia that they want to keep the coal mines open or a community on the Texas, Mexico, down on illegal immigration or in Britain communities that say we don't want to build more houses. So how do you square this vision of letting local communities decide when actually it might be working against the greater good? Great. And if you just pass it to the uh, ATO. Mark, that was a great lecture. Thanks very much. Um, I was struck by the example you gave of care, and I think it works really well to make the points. But as you speak, as you were speaking more generally, I got the sense, perhaps wrongly, that you were using care as a principle, a principle of kind of governance almost for ordinary hope. To, to what extent is that true and how, what does that look like? Oh, that's lovely. So go. Um, yeah, well, I, mean, the, the, I think the question, I was actually going to uh, ask you about the media uh, stuff because, I mean, it is an interesting, I, I have great sympathy as a member of the media, I have a great sympathy for almost any politician attempting to posit any kind of set of ideas because the cynicism of the media is profound. Although I do think, to some extent, that does reflect the sort of causticness with the public as well. I think anyone who has talked to voters a lot, and in a way it speaks to your point around kind of a suspicion of grandiose ideas. But how do you, how do you be, if you were still working for Ed Miliband and he was positing this idea, or indeed if you were advising Keir Starmer, how would you advise him to, how ordinary hope would work in that media ecosystem, as the gentleman said? I mean, it's a great, it's a great question, which, you know, the cop-out answer is that it, you know, deserves several lectures in its own right. I think it's a, such a difficult one, and many people in the room have written uh, you know, very profoundly on it. Um, and there's no doubt that the way that the media is, um, you know, set up, you know, the, who owns large chunks of it, what the agenda might be, how it interacts with digital and social media, makes many of the problems that people are confronting harder. You know, and one of, I, I go back to that James Graham image I used in the talk, you know, that notion of smashing the system and trying to get an answer. You know, one of the reasons that we fall foul for that is because that's what's pumped at us. You know, it, it's a sort of vicious circle, I think. You know, we get angrier, the TV gets angrier, we get angrier in return, you know, Twitter gets angrier, and before you know it, it's just like all there is is anger. Um, and I think that's the challenge, though, because I think what you want to do in that world of anger is inject the moment of calm. And that, you know, bless you. And in a way, that would be my challenge to anybody involved in the political process is, can you find the moment of calm? And my, you know, one of my great heroes um, is the American, Canadian political philosopher, Bonnie Honig. And Bonnie wrote this amazing book. She came out to Australia to talk about it about two, three years ago, trying to understand Trump. 
And, and what Bonnie says is the closest she gets to Trump is torture techniques of overstimulation. So, so I don't know if anyone knows, the, the idea is that you know, what they do is they stick you in a room and they blast music at you and flashing lights and they shout at you. And the idea is you feel so disorientated by that process that you will do anything. And what Bonnie argues in the book is that the left's response in America, initially at least, was to go overstimulated in response. Like they're shouting very loudly, so we need to shout very loud. And, and the argument that Bonnie makes in the book is you can't get, and I, I used it here, you can't get concrete, proper, serious reform when you're all shouting at each other. But time. can that stop? Um, is it possible to stop it? I mean, I think that's, you know, that's the challenge, is, is it possible to stop it? I mean, I think that what we're seeing from both of our party leaders at the moment is an effort to stop it, if I'm honest. You know, both Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak are trying to stop <laughs> that anger in their own particular kinds of ways. Whether they'll be successful at it is a moot point. But I definitely think that in our own lives, we can stop it. You know, um, another hero of mine is an inaugural, I'm allowed to do this. Uh, another hero of mine is Danielle Allen at Harvard. Um, and Danielle's written about these bridging relationships between people. And she says the only way to stop shouting is when you actually know people on the other side. So you're not tempted to shout at them anymore. Uh, and one of the things that we can do here at UCL is introduce people to different perspectives and different worldviews. And that may be a long-term solution, but it does take out some of the anger and opens a space for a you know, stronger, more effective collective coming together. You clearly, clearly haven't been at a morning meeting with a group of journalists. If you know people, they're not going to shout at them. Um, the, devolve, the gentleman's point about the devolving and localism and the sort of tension between those. It's, it's definitely always tempting to go to the to the sort of places where you're less likely to find people who disagree with you and avoid the places where you're likely to find people who do. But politically, you know, with my old fashioned political strategy hat on, I think that's exactly the wrong advice. So, you know, again, when I was in speech writing land, I used to work with a director who helped us um, talk about how to make a speech really effective. And she always used to say to Ed, don't talk to the friendly part of the room, talk to the hardest part of the room. Because if you can make them come with you, then you've got a stronger political coalition than you can imagine. And I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Will Somerville, uh, Unbound Philanthropy, the other day, about work that they've supported in Arizona and Nevada. Over 15 years, when people said that you couldn't turn around the politics of those two states, you couldn't make them less racist, couldn't make them more you know, non-anti-immigrant. And in fact, if any of you have been following the US elections, you'll know that Arizona and Nevada are the two key states now for the Democratic coalition in the Senate. So choosing the hard places that you can win and going with it, I think is the fundamental part of an effective strategy along ordinary hope style lines. The, the latest question about care being a principle. I, 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 again, I love that. I mean, um, I, again, a bit of intellectual hinterland. I'm a sort of Aristotelian. So I, I would call it a kind of a practical wisdom rather than a principle that I think living and leading with care is something that we should all do in our politics. It also then translates into a programme for social action. And I'm intrigued in te teasing the relationship between those two dimensions. Time for a few more, I think. Uh, gentleman there. Oh, I shouldn't neglect the corners. A bit higher. Sorry, I, obviously, I just gestured vaguely. It wasn't very helpful. There's a gentleman there with a the, with the hand up. <laughs> He's right, right in the back. Right in the back. <laughs> there we Thank go. You. Dead um, away. I, I liked your, um, your, your thoughts about care, especially broadened out. But um, you, you mentioned a, a, a rather nub of the issue, I think, in your um, early discussions, which is how to find meaningful and better value-added work for more people. I mean... Our capitalism at the moment, we've got an open market where we sold off a lot of our companies to international investors. We have, as Torsten Bell points out, we're incredibly good at international services. We export them, but everybody's got this fantasy that we can go back to manufacturing stuff, Marmite and all that. Um, you know, and, and the international services sector is dominated by highly educated elite professionals. So... The, the, the large portion of the population that need your, your care agenda um, you know, aren't going to get a look in really for meaningful work. Is that, is that a different part of the solution? Or do you see that as emerging from 
actually looking after people. Okay, anybody else? Lady, right next to you there. Perfect. Uh, hi, Mark. So I want to ask a little bit about how you envision Ordinary Hope informs or sort of expands out into um, Britain's place in the world. So that connection between domestic and international politics. Um, one could argue that perhaps a big part of the decades of economic decline that we've been discussing are a hangover from empire and a little bit of a failure to rethink sort of who and what Britain is uh, if it's not the metropole in the world. Uh, so I'd just be curious to hear yeah. a little bit more about that sort yeah. of international. Um, yeah, more, more. Perhaps we shouldn't ignore the, the rafters, as it were. So, uh, <laughs> It's Jeffrey. Yes, don't worry, we're coming. <laughs> Someone's coming. There we go. Um, thank away. you so much. Um, thank you, Mark, for the um, lecture. So I just want to ask, um, do you think maybe perhaps it's about time we hold politicians accountable and adopt a non-nonsense approach towards misbehaviors? So an uh, example I can think of is Boris Johnson um, partying in the middle of COVID lockdown when we have all the measures in place violating his own policies. Perhaps do you think that if we were to start, figuratively speaking, hanging politicians for misbehaving, it will help to resolve the anger of the masses because in a way, I feel like people are unhappy, especially when leaders, they misbehave and seem to get away with it. And it's like they're not being held responsible. Thank you. I mean, on that point, I mean, it has fueled the, the, the caustic cynicism that I was talking about. I mean, that point has fueled it, hasn't it? I mean, people feel that there is profound injustice in the way that politics operates, and indeed have come to almost expect it, so even don't get angry about it sometimes. No, no, I'm, I look, the, the truth, I think, is, and I, I think we need to take stock of it, the, tr the truth is that the disconnect between elite-level politics and everyday life is much discussed, you know, both in the academic literature and, you know, in, the, in, in politics, uh, and has occasionally people just kind of say, oh, well, you know, you've said that before, um, but it is a fundamental phenomenon of the last 20 or 30 years. And, um, everyone should read Peter Mayer's book, Ruling the Void, if you haven't read it. I mean, it's just an extraordinary piece of political science examining you know, what's gone on to separate elite politicians from you know, everyday people. And the argument in that book is that it's the collapse of mediating institutions that used to connect people and their, and their representatives like trade unions and faith groups and you know, and obviously you can't recreate them by magic, but what could you do to bring the two closer together? That seems to me to be a fundamental question. The but is, I think, again, folks can disagree, but I, I think that it's the separation which is the problem, rather than politicians being, you know, a kind of nasty or bad group of people. I mean, there are nasty and bad politicians, definitely, and there are people who behave reprehensibly, uh, in you know extraordinary circumstances where they shouldn't have done so, but as a whole, uh, the politicians that I've had the pleasure to work with, both in Australia and in the UK, are not like that. They are decent, sensible people trying to do their best in a system that doesn't work very well, and they need us to help them reconnect rather than create more and more barriers of suspicion and anger. So, I mean, I'm, I'm from the sort of give politicians a break school of thought. But I'm not in denial that they are separated out from the mainstream of society in ways which are damaging to our democracy. Uh, and the latest point about Britain's place in the world, is there any ordinary hope for Britain's place in the world? I, so I think especially it, beleaguered at the moment. It's a, such a crucial question. Look, for me, the craziest, grandiose, utopian vision of the last 20 years is the lies which were told about Brexit. I mean, it was sold to the British people as a solution which nobody actually thought it could be. And it operated in that kind of political space. It was uh, a fantasy which was g given to people who were in desperate need of an answer to real problems. And that, I think, is not accidental. I think that Britain, uh, partly, as you said in the question, you know, challenging and confronting and analysing Britain's place in the world has at least since the end of empire or during empire been characterised by even more grandiose, meaningless abstraction and less reality and ordinariness than domestic politics has. But the only way of actually getting anywhere is to stop doing all the you know, overly inflated stuff 
start to understand what Britain really is, what advantages it has and what disadvantages it has, where it needs to find its allies, where it needs to find its trading partners, and be just much more boring uh, about understanding its place in the world. You know, that's the that's my biggest answer there. So take the quality of jobs question. Yes, yes, briefly, if you will. Then. Yeah, so on the quality of jobs question, I, I think it's a profound issue. My thought, which is totally stolen from Tilson, who will claim that I've completely ruined this as well, So, because uh, he knows far more than me about this. My sense is that there are two kinds of jobs in Britain. There are, there are some very successful service sectors, and we need to make those jobs accessible to people of all backgrounds and from all parts of the country. So we shouldn't be trying to close down the service sector or trying to pretend it doesn't exist. We should be celebrating it, training people for it, and making it you know, easier for people to find their way into it. But there are also jobs which aren't ever going to be of that kind. You know, the sort of, they're not jobs in financial services or on MTV. They are the kind of jobs in Blackpool that I was describing, which are just as needed for our country as those other fancier, whizzier jobs, but have for decades now been undervalued by politicians of all stripes. And that's the challenge that I often put to academics, you know, economists, uh, social geographers here at UCL. It's like, how do we get the quality of those jobs to improve? Because they're not going away. Those are the jobs that people are going to do. Those are the jobs that we need people to do. But how can we make sure that they pay better, uh, they're more enjoyable to do, and they actually perform the service that's required of them? And I would love to see massive engagement in that space. Much, much better to do that than to come up with yet another fantasy that somehow manufacturing is going to return uh, in a vast way to the rest of the country and jobs which disappeared in the 1950s are going to reappear. They're, they're not. So Mark, I think we've got to uh, wrap up very, very shortly. Uh, but as you said, conversation can continue over drinks, which is always the best conversation in my view. Um, just before we wrap up, um, just wondering, do you think in terms of ordinary hope, is there anything, I mean, obviously your association is with the left. If Rishi Sunak were in the audience, I don't think he's here. But if he were sat at the back somewhere watching this and he was thinking, what on earth do I do to resurrect my premiership and the Conservative Party's open office? Could he, is there something that the right could absorb and I'm, take it on? Or is it apolitical in that way? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I have absolutely no doubt that there is an agenda here which works across political boundaries. And I think, look, the evidence of that for those, those people who don't, um, you know, sort of follow think tanks, etc. is the success that Onward has had in the Conservative Party is, I think, testament to the power of the ideas I've been trying to talk about tonight. So Onward is a, is a right-wing think tank, conservative think tank, but it's engaged in precisely the kind of debates that I've been talking about, trying to step away from excessive grandiosity, trying to focus on community, on place, on the quality of jobs, on everyday interactions, and um, it's had an extraordinary impact, so, you know, so much so that its director was you know, taken away from onward and now works uh, number 10 with Rishi Sunak. So, so he is um, listening. So, so uh, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 Will Tanner wrote me a very lovely email, who was the director of onward now works for Rishi Sunak, wrote me a very lovely email when I got this job, which was one of the nicest things to return to, saying um, that he loved the stuff in Out of the Ordinary, um, my last book, and just wished that there was a version for the Conservative Party. So... Hopefully somewhere out there is writing that uh, and it's just as important to engage on that side of the spectrum as it is on the other. And how hopeful are you? Ah, oh, look, I'm, I'm immensely hopeful because I'm just incredibly excited by what I've seen in the very few months that we've been here at the Policy Lab. Like, you know, both here tonight and at our launch events and our interactions at the party conferences, at the various projects that we've got funded from philanthropists out there, so many people in Britain right now believe two things. They believe that it's separation from other people that holds us back. So if we start to break down barriers between people, we can do more. And they believe that this desperate state of affairs that I've described in the talk in places like Blackpool, places like South Wales, can't be allowed to continue. And there must become a realisation in all walks of life that if we're not going to return to the golden age, we nonetheless want to get back to a place where we have a positive sense of our future again. Mark, it's been absolutely fascinating. As I say, uh, my understanding is, is that drinks will take place in the cloisters. Very grand. 
sand and cloisters. Uh, but until then, so please come along uh, and join us for that. But until then, just invite you all to put your hands together and say an enormous thank you to Professor Matthew. <laughs>